Do you ever find yourself searching for something bigger than you? For a community to be a part of? A place founded on truth and love. A place to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Son of God. Welcome to Founded in Truth, where we're more than just a fellowship. We're a family, so welcome home. So, um, guys, we are, we are still journeying through Matthew chapter 6. We are kind of, kind of past the halfway point for the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this revolutionary sermon that was preached 2,000 years ago on the mountainside in, in Galilee by this no-name rabbi from Nazareth named Joshua or Yeshua. And this sermon started a revolution. This sermon was so radical that it got this rabbi killed. This sermon was so radical that it has gotten his followers killed for the past 2,000 years. This sermon preached a way of life, a way of life of a people of God and how they, how they acted in a world and how this people of God acted when his Torah is actually written on their heart. And it's something that the world hates to hear because it goes against everything. It collides against everything that the world stands for. And so we went through Matthew chapter 5 the last few weeks and we went through the first part of Matthew chapter 6 and, and we're going to continue today speaking about prayer and speaking about the Lord's Prayer. One of the most uh, well-known prayers in the world and yet I would dare say one of the prayers that is, that is least recited among Christians, at least Protestants. Anybody guilty of, the, anybody sit down and pray and never even think about the Lord's Prayer? Like that's just something that we learned to memorize in Sunday school. And so we pray and we have this grand, unique, like original, like this is polished with my fingerprints, like from my heart prayer to God, which is good. But we never, the only time we really recite the Lord's Prayer is like when we come to fellowship and someone actually says to and then we're like, okay, I know this from Sunday school. I got this. When Yeshua says, every day. When Luke says, every time you pray, say this. There's something revolutionary about this prayer that, that for a very long time, from its preaching, fueled this radical revolutionary movement of Yeshua. And so let's just jump in. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, if you can turn with me there. And, and we're going to see what he says right, right before we go into this famous prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. And Yeshua is speaking, and he says, When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Therefore, pray like this. Dot, 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 dot. So, I wanted to, this is a verse that we're kind of familiar with, but I wanted to throw up a couple of translations. So, this is the English Standard Version, which I kind of like. It's nice. And it's also the default in my Bible software, so it is what it is. Um, we also have a Holman Bible. Holman's Bible. Holman Bible, uh, when you pray, don't babble like the idolater. That's a little dramatic. Don't babble like the idol worshipers over there. And then you have uh, the faithful King James Version, King Jimmy. Um, we, this is the one we're familiar with. And, and the reason why I want to point out these phrases is because we, we've probably never heard this verse in our memory. We don't think of do not heap up empty phrases. And a lot of times when we remember this verse, we don't, we don't think of babbling like the idol word. We typically think of this translation, the original King James, where it says, When you pray, don't use or use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard 
for their much speaking. Out of these three translations, which one kind of perks your ears up the most? Is it vain repetitions? That's, most of us are taught that. Um, and, uh, and the reason why I bring this up um, is because that word in Greek is badalageo, the vain repetition slash babble slash long-windedness slash empty phrases, badalageo. And we don't have a clue what it means. I mean, cat's out of the bag, sorry. It, we don't know what it means. The only reason why it's translated as empty phrases, vain repetitions, and babbling is because of the second part of what Yeshua says here. It adds context to the word, so it has to do something with empty phrases. Like the pagans do, for they try to be heard by their many words. Well, Badalageo must have something to do with that, right? Um, and I believe it does. So, so here we go. Yeshua's, Yeshua's calling us out from empty phrases to vain repetitions, uh, which tends to be the most popular quoted verse. Um, I bring this up because Yeshua just reveals something. Whether it hits you or not, Yeshua just revealed that he knows about your heart. And he's been doing this all through the Sermon on the Mount. And this is one of those instances that we're about to jump in again where it's a little awkward if you were standing beside him because now you know he knows your heart. And Yeshua kind of hits home here. Yeshua is going to teach us how to pray. And when you talk to God, don't do it like the pagans. Why? Because the pagans believe their God is off doing something else. Perhaps their God is sleeping. Or in Elijah's case, perhaps their God is busy in the bathroom. And so if you want something really, 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 really bad, you've got to get their God's attention in such a way that you can coax them from, from waking up from their sleep or, or, or running out of the bathroom to come to your rescue. You have to, like, try to get their attention in order to get something that you want from them. And this is called pagan theology. This is literally the theology of the ancient Gentiles, ancient pagans in the Roman Empire. And they had gods that they could cry out to and petition to. They could manipulate their own gods' wills. At least that's what they thought. And they could manipulate them based on how much attention or emotion or loudness or fullness of words they spoke. More than everyone else. If I can scream louder than everyone else, if I can spend more time talking than everyone else, then maybe that God will favor me and give me what I want. So Yeshua is asking the question, what God do you worship? Do you pray to that kind of God? Or do you pray to the one true God? The God of Israel. The God that loves his children as a father. She was saying, don't pray to another God. Our God is greater. He's much greater than that. Our God is so great, he says, Our God is so great that he knows what you need before you pray for it. Don't discard that thought. I know what some of you did. Some of it went in, and it kind of confused you a little bit, so you're like, okay, I'm just going to go with it. No, let it, let, it, let it hit you. If you're slightly confused by this, embrace it right now. Embrace it. What do you mean he knows what I'm going to pray? He knows what I need before I pray it. That doesn't make sense. That's the whole reason I pray. Just shh, embrace it. Embrace that's how big your God is right now. And find comfort in that. Find comfort in that. That's a wow level of greatness. Pagans ain't got that. Okay, so why do we have to pray if God already knows what I need? Sheesh, Matt. Because prayer is not about you getting stuff. Prayer is about connecting to God. And God connecting to you. It's a shared experience of intimacy between you and God. That's what, that's what prayer is. That's what prayer with the God of Israel is. The God of Israel is not simply a Santa Claus. If that's who you're wanting, boy, in Western culture about 100 years ago, Macy's and Coca-Cola created a God for you, a big old red suit and everything. You can pray to him if you want. This God, your God, is bigger. You don't treat your God like the God of the pagans. 
treat your God like a father that you have a relationship with. And I wanted to show multiple translations uh, today because if you're like me, you've likely attended a church at some time in your life that hyper-focused on the first part of this verse while cutting off the context of the latter. So we're moving into a little sermon to a little bit of Bible geek stuff because I like to have fun with this as well. Um, vain repetitions. Vain repetitions. I, w- I, I was told by, by, by one church that this is repeating yourself. And if you repeat yourself, you're pagan. If you stutter, just don't even try. Get someone else to pray for you. You don't want to be pagan. If you're a just Justin, and I mentioned this last week because that's totally me. If you're a just Justin, when you're excited, your excitement for prayer and your excitement for experiencing God makes you a bit nervous with your words and you end up repeating just 20 times in a prayer, right? May God have mercy on you. Because <laughs> you're pagan. I actually heard one commentary um, that actually said that Yeshua was ver- referring to Jewish prayer when he did this, because the Judeans at the time, they have these prayers that they say every day in the standing prayers and the evening, and they have these books, they have books, and sidors now, prayer books, and they say the same prayers over and over and over again, right? And I had one commentary tell me, like, that's what Yeshua is talking about. Like, you're not supposed to repeat prayers. They've got to be fully crafted from your heart and your soul, 100% authentic. If not, it's plagiarism, and it's pagan. And the, the issue I have with this assertion is the Bible, and what it says in this verse about the Gentiles and the idol worshipers and the heathens and the pagans, not people who pray to the God of Israel. And we tend to take this line of thought of hyper-literal level, as we discussed last week, and we say like nothing can be repeated when you pray. And it's not just in prayers at this point. We, we transition that over to all areas of our worship, including praise. So now praise cannot be repeated. You know what my favorite song to sing on Rev Shabbat is with my boy and my wife? Shabbat Shalom. I love it. Can we sing Shabbat Shalom together in a way that's not pagan? Okay, you ready? Shabbat Shalom. Stop! (laughs) The point is not about repetition. It's, it's, it's not even about spending a long time in prayer to God. You know how I know this? Because Yeshua, in Luke 6, 12, went up on a mountain and prayed all night. There may have been a time, maybe in your life, that you have prayed all night long. This is what Yeshua did. And we like to get judgmental about it when people like, are, are praying for a, ho- a long, long, long time and they're, and they're engaging with God for a long time. And we're like, we're like, that just can't be sincere. All night, your Savior, your Rabbi that you follow. And Yeshua is warning us about putting energy in manipulating God. This is what this is talking about. And if you're, you are not a puppet master to God, don't do that because that's pagan. That's how the pagans pray. Revisiting the same phrase or even the same prayer each time you pray is something that was prevalent in Judaism long before the first century and after and was prevalent in Christianity from the first century all the way for about 1,900 years to about 100 years ago. Standardized prayer. Didn't mean it wasn't sincere. Didn't mean it was bad. Didn't mean it was pagan. Meant that's just the tradition started in the first century, adapted from Judaism, from a Jewish rabbi. And it's really only been recent uh, when we've actually been encouraged to to take our prayers to be spontaneous only, um, which I like. But what I guess what I'm trying to say is. I don't want you to get me liking spontaneous prayers 
confused with absoluteness, and me liking standardized prayers with absoluteness, because if we look at history, they're both prevalent in Christian history. In fact, Yeshua, in Luke, says in the Greek, do you know what he says? He says, each time you pray, he doesn't say pray like this in the Greek. He says, recite this. Recite this. If we take the Greek literally, literally he says, every time you go to pray, recite the standardized prayer that I just gave you in the Greek. Yeshua is concerned about one main thing in your life in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's not, he's concerned about your actions, but he's more concerned about what? Your intentions and your heart and what is fueling your actions. What is fueling your prayer? If you repeat yourself, if you're so lost in intimacy with God that you begin to babble a little bit in prayer, or you begin to repeat yourself a little bit in prayer, or you say just too many times, that's beautiful. Yeshua is addressing what the heart is, and are you trying to manipulate God and treat him like the God that the pagans worship? Singing songs um, in a repetitive manner is how most of us uh, teach our children about the wonderful values that we can instill in them in their life. It's how Hebrew uh, blessings are often taught to children. It's how we learn things in school. Let me, let me give you an example. Um, so you had an amazing life. Uh, if, you can, if you know this, this, I'm sure you... Broccoli, celery, gotta be veggie tails. I, I know this. <laughs> veggie tails. It's, a, it's an okay show. It is a funny show. I have a disagreement with the theology, but we got it. So Ben is at the age where he can watch veggie tails now, so guess what we listen to, and guess what he sings all along. It's part of being a human. <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeshua, Yeshua wants you to be focusing on something here. And it's not, it's not necessarily what you're saying, it's why you're saying it. Are you saying it for the same reasons that the pagans are for their gods? Or do you not know that your God so intimately loves and knows you and is big enough that he already knows what you need? He just wants to hear from you. He just wants to connect with you. He just wants to spend time with you. He doesn't want you babbling off about your Christmas list, wish list, sorry. He wants to hear from you as his daughter and as his son. And so now, Yeshua kind of shifts gears, and he goes into teaching us how he expects us to pray. Okay? So here we go. Verse 9, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's it. That's, this is the king of the heavenly kingdom has come to, the Christ, the Messiah, the Mashiach. And he is about to teach us the most potent way to pray to God. This is the prayer that you need to memorize. Are you ready? Yeah. Like five sentences later. Is it? Is it? That was kind of short. Reference back to the passages before this. <laughs> what is the intent here? It's not about how long or short the prayer is. Your prayer does not need to be ten minutes long to be effective. What Yeshua is showing here is he's saying, look at the intention of this prayer. This is what I want you to pray every day. And so we're not going to look at the length of the prayer today. We're going to look at what? The intention of what Yeshua is saying and just how, how much he packs into this small little poem, if you will. I love it. Our Father, holy is your name, set apart. Notice how he says our. Our. Do you want to know why he says our? Because originally this was intended to be a public prayer. This was intended to be a communal prayer. When we gather together and we pray together, we say this together. Our Father, holy is your name. Mm. And this term Father kind of brings together at least two attributes of God. His intimate love for his children, as well as a sovereign power over creation, which is invoked in heaven, God of heaven. 
to, God, to call God a father, as we discussed, I think, a few weeks ago, to call God a father is to receive the love and mercy that he would give. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is it. This is, this is something, this is the verse in the Bible that I get most excited about, I think, at this point in my life. Because this one verse embodies everything the gospel represents. Matt, what is that on the screen? Guys, this is creation, the way that God made it. This is Genesis 1, when God formed his good creation. Every aspect was good and ready to be launched forward as him, as king over the world. And, and if you notice, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Heaven and earth were one. God walked face to face with man. The kingdom of heaven was fully engulfed on earth, in the garden and with man. Man looked at God and said, your reign is supreme, we serve you. And God's kingdom fully manifests in the world. His love, his forgiveness, his mercy, all of his attributes had fully engulfed the world. And it gets me excited every time I talk about this because the Bible tells this story. It tells a story about God creating his good creation where man and God had fully communed together in the garden as one. And then, and then man decided to seek autonomy from God in the garden. And he allowed the words of the serpent to infiltrate the garden, infiltrate their soul. And they said, you know what? Maybe we, maybe we can, we can choose good and evil better than God can. We can determine good and evil better than God can. We don't need God to rule our life. This was the moment that God was pushed away from his good creation through the actions and decisions of mankind. The fall of man, if you will. The story of the Bible continues the point continues to say that, that, that mankind produced violence on the earth and hatred and injustice in God's good creation. The, the world had become a dark, dark place. But God makes a promise. And God makes the promise that, that he will forgive man and that he will take mankind back and reconciliation will happen and heaven, his kingdom, will overtake the world once again, just as it was in the beginning. This is the story of the Bible. I will be one with you. Restoration of my good creation will occur. And the story continues from this point forward. And it speaks about a no-name rabbi from Nazareth. This Yeshua that stands up, that would love the unlovable, that heals the unhealable, that forgives the unforgivable. He actually, if, if you notice all through the gospel accounts, he hosts these parties. Heard one, one, one teacher refer to them as forgiveness parties, where the prostitute and the tax collectors could come in and sit down as his friends. Hey, you're an image bearer just like me. I want to show you God's love, and I want to show you how you can show others God's love. Come, dine with me. Forgiveness parties. I like that term. And he makes his displays of compassion on these people, the outcasts. And he begins to heal every single person that has a sickness and he forgives those who are unforgivable. He, he begins to walk out the prophecies of Isaiah. When Isaiah speaks about God's kingdom returning and fulfilling God's promises. Mankind may have pushed heaven away from earth, God's reign away from earth, but in Yeshua, in the place that Yeshua stands, heaven is remarried to earth and to his creation. This is, this is the story of the Bible, and this is, this is what Yeshua asks us to pray for. He says, God, that your kingdom would come, and that your will, as king of the king, would be done. Where? On earth, as it is in heaven. That your government would once again overtake your kingship would be once again recognized in this world. Isaiah speaks about a time where swords will be made into plowshares. That's God's kingdom. Isaiah talks about a time where all relationships will be reconciled. That's God's kingdom. Isaiah speaks about a time where hatred and malice will no longer be something that's... That's God's kingdom. This is what Yeshua pointed to you 
and said, you see me carrying out God's kingdom? Do you see me bringing heaven to earth now? Putting out the fires of hell that we've caused? I want you to follow me. I want you to be an ambassador of Christ, as Paul calls us. A representative of the kingdom. Guys, what Yeshua is offering us is a chance to partake alongside him in bringing heaven back to earth. Bit by bit. With every action that we do. To bring about the end of Isaiah. To bring about the end of Revelation. To bring about this time period when God's love is fully felt in all the world. That's what this prayer is, is focusing on. That's what it focuses on. And, and we make the mistake. We make the mistake as believers of making the gospel message about, about being saved from this dark world and escaping it one day. See, we make the message of the gospel more about, let's see here, more about us being here and being saved from this dark place and being saved so we can go here and be with God. This is not a biblical concept. It was actually a Gnostic concept. <laughs> the reality is, is you weren't made to escape this world. You were made for this world that has become dark and God has charged you to bring heaven to earth once again along the leadership of his son. That's what the kingdom coming is all about. That's everything that Yeshua preaches. And I stress that, and I talk about this a lot because, guys, this is, this is our mission. This is our faith. This is what we're called to do in the way that our heart produces and our actions. And the Sermon on the Mount is exactly what Yeshua says this kind of people looks like. Where you no longer objectify people in your heart. When you no longer hate someone in your heart. When you no longer carry unforgiveness with you. This is what a kingdom people looks like. And, and, and in the Bible, Paul, Paul and Yeshua both call these two separate domains something different. See, Paul calls kind of the, the, this area, like the, 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 the age that we find ourselves in this world. He says this present evil age. Yeshua calls it the world around us, the darkness world. Um, and of course, you know, God's kingdom, if you were the reality of God's fullness and who he is and intimacy is called uh, heaven. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it would also be called like the world to come. The world to come. Um, in Judaism, they have a concept called the Alam Haba, the world to come. And it's the idea that, that one day in Judaism, one day God is actually going to do something to fulfill the promises of bringing his kingdom to earth. I'm thankful that I know Yeshua has birthed that. I love that. And Yeshua says, if you're in me, then you have life. Yeshua says, welcome to that kingdom now. And the moment that you pledge your allegiance to Yeshua as king, the moment that you pledge your allegiance to this kingdom of heaven, that's the moment that you enter into eternity. When you begin to enter this world to come that is prophesied about Isaiah, by Isaiah and Jeremiah. Here's a familiar verse. <laughs> Can you kill the background? Anyone familiar with this verse? We learned this one in Sunday school, right? John 3, 16. Is, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And we always see this verse as, if I believe in Jesus, I will escape from this world when I die and I'll go to heaven and I'll live forever. Anybody? That's what we perceive when we see this verse. I don't believe this is what this verse is trying to tell us. As I said, the, the, the prophetic expectation of the first century was something completely different. It wasn't escaping anything. The verse is speaking of something in the first century that was very, very, very familiar. God's new age spoken about by the prophets themselves that would come. That a king would come and he would de defeat the principalities that hold us back from God and God's kingdom would be ushered in and reign forever and ever. God so loved the world that he sent his son and whoever pledges their allegiance to him will enter into this eternal new age where heaven is once again manifest where God's kingdom is once again touchable and intimate. 
This is the age to come. This is the Alam Haba. And in Yeshua, the biblical authors seem to claim this has happened. And that you can be a part of it here and now. I love that. And so here is the setting behind the rest of the Lord's Prayer. Everything that it is spoke about. It's the creed of our mission. It's the creed for how we should live. And it's the creed for, for yes, how we petition God. But also how we should solidify it in our lives as believers. And, and he continues. He says, he says, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts and also as we forgive those who have debts against us. Bread. So interesting. Many commentaries about this verse. Bread, heaven, forgiveness, and deliverance is pretty much the the, the stack of the Lord's Prayer. This is the items, the key items. And um, daily bread. So Yeshua here is doing what he's doing, and he's doing a very Jewish thing. Um, he's alluding to something already in the Scriptures, but also giving a new teaching alongside it. And, um, and I really appreciate something David Wilbur said. Um, I think a little while ago, a couple weeks ago, he, he said something that was profound. He said, he said, my favorite Jewish literature is the New Testament. I love that. That was like, yes. So Yeshua is alluding to something already in the scriptures, and he's bringing up a new teaching beside it, or a new way to fulfill it, or a new way to implement it in his life. So, so daily bread. Can you think of a time in the biblical narrative or the biblical storyline, maybe in the Old Testament, where bread was given daily? And it's a time when the people had to depend on God for their most basic needs. Anybody? Manna? Manna? Manna. Right. Manna. You know what manna means? What is it? What is it? The wet bread. <laughs> what is this? We can eat it? <laughs> Read the description of it. It's a gnarly looking thing that fell from heaven. This is the residue that you can make flour out of. I don't know. It's just neat. Manna. And it's part of the Exodus story, right? Yeshua's entire ministry revolves around the first Exodus and kind of mimicking off that. And it, and it revolves around looking back at the first Exodus and then fulfilling the prophecies of the second Exodus that Isaiah and Jeremiah spoke about, that we have spoke about in the last series. Tons of Exodus motives, like, uh, like Matthew's account of Yeshua's birth being very eerily similar to Moses, you know, both, born a little, both placed in a little basket, assumed of straw or whatnot. You have a ruler that's trying to kill him. You have people who are working for the ruler, but they lie to the king to save lives, right? Um, you have Yeshua going into Egypt. You have all these little, little parallels that are fascinating. You have him walking up to a mount in Galilee, and Matthew says, the mountain, to speak the laws on behalf of God. I mean, you have this, this second Moses type of narrative going on there, undertones. And when Israel was given manna, it was, it was, it was after they had been redeemed from Egypt. But it was before they entered into the ultimate promises of God. They had not entered into the climax of coming into the land yet. So they were wandering around, fully dependent on God for their needs, and fully dependent on God's sustenance and his resources to keep them going. And this is, this is what we, as the followers of Yeshua, are doing. We've been redeemed. And we've been redeemed not from Pharaoh or slavery in Egypt, but, but from death and the slavery to sin, the greatest exodus of all. And here we find ourselves walking and wandering on this journey, giving witness to the greatness of our God, all while waiting and hoping and anticipating the fullness of God's promises to engulf the world. It's, it's as if, see Paul talks about us, ah, going back to my animations, I love them. It, it's as if Paul is, Paul is talking about, you know, when he, when he talks about us being a kingdom, of a, a part of a kingdom that's not of this earth, the kingdom of heaven. But where are we now? Are we still here on earth? But our citizenship is in heaven, in which we live out our faith. That's what Hebrews 11.1 1 talks about. We walk out our faith with substance. So it's almost like we're, we got one leg down here in this world, and we got another leg up here, right? With the presence and the intimacy and the reconciliation with God. We haven't quite went. We haven't quite found. We haven't experienced what the end of Isaiah speaks about yet. We haven't entered into the land yet but we've been redeemed and we're wandering and we're taking that journey. We're taking that journey and continuing to walk 
and dependent on God for the resources he's giving us as his people. Does that make sense? Kind of? Okay, good. I love my little, there we go. Go ahead and knock that. <laughs> when we're on this journey as a believer, does anyone ever get distracted? We can be real. Anyone ever get distracted? Anyone feel like they're facing battles along the way? The Moabites are attacking, except for it might not be the Moabites. It may be that guy at work. You know? It may be unforgiveness. It may be anger. It may be lust. It may be gossip. It may be whatever. And we're depending on God to give us everything that we need so that we can stay focused on what his mission is for us. That we would not turn into the people that say that want to go back to Egypt because they had watermelons. Yeshua wants to try through this prayer, this creed of allegiance. He wants to try, he wants to try to implement this mindset in every single one of his disciples of a beggar or a vagabond of someone who truly is on a journey, of someone who, who, who is not entitled to have everything. And he wants you to have this mindset regardless of your lifestyle or your wealth or what you have or your possessions or your esteem or your honor. He wants you to have this. He wants you to, to have a mindset where every single piece of bread that you pick up, you say, thank you, God, for giving me what I need today because this is about basic needs. And when you drive your car and look at that, you have shelter and that you're wearing clothes. He, he wants you to say, wow, I'm so, thank you, God, for giving me the basic resources that I have. And not to look at everything else that you had or acquired or your pursuits and look at them, not to look at them as things like, yeah, these are things that I need too. This was radical. Do you know why he wants you to formulate this mindset? Because if you're so focused on just the basic needs of what you have, when you look at all the other stuff you have, Wow, well, these aren't really my basic needs. I don't need all this stuff. Oh, but someone over there needs some stuff. So then you give it to them. And someone over there, oh, I have my basic needs. God has met my basic needs. Here, let me help you with yours. Let God meet yours. That's what happened in the, in the, in the church in Acts, right? They all get up in this community, and they were like, yeah, we got our basic needs. Here, you take all our stuff. Eh, that's crazy. What are they thinking? We live in a world that is fueled by capitalism where we, where, we, where we don't think about what we can be generous with, mimicking the entire backbone of the gospel. We, we think of like, why do I need to give so much? Maybe it's just me. Okay. Maybe it's just me and the culture that I live in. So we're having a fundraiser for diapers, for foster care, for children that, that have been ripped away from their families by a decision that was not their own. And they're sleeping in a stranger's house, and they have this new temporary mommy and daddy, and who are these people, and now they have these other kids around them, and who are they? And we're trying to raise diapers, money for diapers and whites to give to the parents so that, so that they can have everything they need to put energy into these children. And, and maybe not you, but I'll just say an example. We think sometimes like, ah, maybe I can get 50 bucks. Now, in our culture, we would say, oh, but that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Do I have to give that much? A family has their house burned down, and they have a GoFundMe page. We need help getting it. I'll give 20 bucks. And I'm not sitting here trying to be like this, you know, holier than thou up here. This is me too. This is the culture that we have allowed to train us. And Yeshua is saying, you have bread? You, have, you got diabetes? Yeah. You got insulin? Yeah, praise God I do. You got milk in the fridge? Yeah. You got clothes for your kids? Yeah. Praise God he's given you everything that you need. And Yeshua is trying to break, break this mindset of protecting our kingdom. And that's a hard one. That's a hard one. So you guys know Pete? Pete's car died yesterday, day before yesterday. There's Marco and me and everything, and he's going down the road. And he's like, yeah, it keeps overheating, so I'm just driving a mile at a time. I'm, can I come get you? He's like, no, nah, I'm almost home. It's fine. So, so what happens? Well, we're, uh, you know, Amy and Max, they got a spare car. 
So they're like, all right, Pete, you can borrow our car while you get it fixed. Great, great. I got a car. Like, praise God, I got a car. How many of you guys would let someone borrow a car? Can we, are we not going to be honest? Like, you, we got a new couple. How many of you guys would let, like, I guess a stranger or maybe someone even in your own fellowship, like, a car is a lot of money. That's also a lot of liability. That's your insurance. Like, that's a lot of, yeah, Pete, you can go get it. You can borrow it as long as you need it. And then you have another aspect of community stepping in. When Tim gets off, hey, you didn't know I knew, I know. <laughs> when Tim gets off work and books it over to Pete's house to look at the car, giving up his time and his energy to diagnose a bad radiator. So they order another one, and Pete's going to drive this car around that's not his, and he's going to get this, this radiator installed in his car with time and energy that's not his, because this is how believers act with each other, because they understand that they have their needs met. Max and Amy know they got one car. They can share it. Happens, right? It's not always fun, but it happens. They got their needs met. Yeah, we can meet this. I know Tim wants to go home and spend his time doing whatever he likes to do. No, I, I got my time. I'm okay. I can come over. Give us our bread, our daily bread. Give us our daily bread. Give us the things that we need so that we can focus on the things that we need to be doing, Father. It's a big one. That's a big one. This is a prayer that we're supposed to say every day that instills in us the spirit of generosity. This little point, this little prayer that Yeshua gives to us. This is what fueled this entire revolution. It's amazing. Um, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Mm. So we touched on this a little bit in the last chapter about turning the other cheek about forgiving your enemies, loving your enemies. Forgiveness is a big one. Forgiveness is the backbone of, of forgiveness and generosity. They go hand in hand. It's the backbone of this revolution of Yeshua. And it, it is something about retaliating. It's something about, about someone offending you and not retaliating. It, there's something huge about not responding to offense with an offense. About not responding to anger and hostility with anger and hostility like the world does there's something about responding to offense with love and mercy and grace that that seems to accelerate heaven being manifest in this dark world we're supposed to shine our light there's something there's something about this being a fuel that really shines the light of god and yeshua is obsessed with it the climax of the kingdom qualities they were displayed on the cross when the world threw everything they had at Yeshua with suffering, insults, violence, and death. And his response? Self-sacrificial love. This, this is the perfect conduit for my father to show his self-sacrificial love to the world. Wow. This is how we make the kingdom of God manifest and visible in this world. It's how we resemble the image of God. This is how you follow your king, forgiveness. And you say this daily. You, say, you remind yourself of this daily. You say, I am forgiven, therefore I forgive. And as we discussed, discussed in the cost of following a few weeks back, the world thinks that they have the right to retaliate to offense. If you are offended, you have the free speech to respond with offense. Right? Everyone thinks it's a trap. Don't we have free speech to respond however we want to respond in this good, God-given country we live in? Which I'm proud to live in. I love this country and the freedoms that it gives. It's amazing. It's truly a blessing. But our nation truly promotes this idea that if you're offended, if you're offended, then you have the right to retaliate. And you, 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 have, you are expected to retaliate with the same measure of offensiveness towards others. And here, here Yeshua says, that's not how my kingdom works. Yeshua is saying that if you're his follower, you forfeit your right to retaliate, to offense. You forfeit the right to harbor unforgiveness and anger and malice towards another human being, another image bearer despite what they've done to you. You forfeit your right 
to be like the world. Because the, the world tells us if someone wrongs you, you respond with another wrong. The world tells us that if, that if someone does evil towards you, then you respond with evil. Yeah, but it's justice. Okay. If someone offends you and says something nasty about you, then you have the right to respond with the same thing. And then what happens, right? Everything gets resolved, right? Everything gets resolved because justice has been like served and you met equal weights and measures and it's great. What typically, res- how does the- what typically happens after someone says your mama and then you go, no, your mama? What typically happens after this? No, I got another your mama in my back pocket. And then so on and so forth. Flash back to middle school, some of you? Yeah. <laughs> Retaliation does not defeat evil. Why do you think God promised never to flood the earth again? So he flooded the earth to defeat violence. Did it work? Something better and bigger has to happen here. I'm going to have to do something bigger. It's a huge message in that alone. Mm. When someone does something to you, we're called, we're called to forgive. And forgiveness is not becoming a doormat for someone else. And forgiveness is not to take a sinful, evil measure of action towards you and just swipe it under the rug and say, no, that's okay, it's no big deal. If evil has come against you, it is a big deal. Forgiveness has to do with calling that sin out. Forgiveness has to do with saying, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. It needs to be called out. And there's something better for you in your life. And I don't hold unforgiveness from you, but I'm calling this sin out. And I will not let it go any further, especially through me. Forgiveness has to do with stopping evil in the world by absorbing it and calling it out for what it is. It's not being a doormat. It's not. It's not. When Yeshua was on the cross, he took every, every sin, hatred, malice. He took unforgiveness. He took every offense. He took every broken, vain relationship. He took, he took every, everything that hurts and that causes you pain. He took that into himself. And he doesn't get even. This is how he defeats it. And what's he say on his time at the cross? He looks down at everyone throwing these things at him, and he says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They've never experienced the kingdom of God. They have no idea of your peace and love and mercy and grace, God. They don't know what a renewed spirit, they don't know what a new creation is like. God, they don't have a clue what they're doing. Forgive them. Use this moment to shine your light so that all of them could be one with you, so that your love would overtake the world. So as his followers, this section of this prayer is meant to remind us of that. When we pray it every day, it's to remind us of that. It's to remind us of what was established on the cross and how we are supposed to reciprocate that moving forward as the ambassadors of that. And that's tough. That's tough. That's tough. Why is this so important? This is Yeshua speaking. Right, the verse right after the Lord's Prayer, verse 14, if you have your Bibles, you can look at it. it says, Yeshua is saying, he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Well, Matt, that's not a very loving God right there. I mean, God won't forgive you your trespasses if you don't forgive others. Not, not if you're struggling with forgiveness. And not if like, oh, I'm thinking about forgiving them. No, Yeshua is so blunt here. It's, it's disturbing. It's so raw. If you do not forgive, you won't be forgiven. It's harsh. It's harsh. But it isn't. 
Because, because Yeshua is recognizing that there is no middle ground for someone who claims to have experienced the ultimate forgiveness of God in their life and in their being. And there's no excuses. The cross, that was taken for you, that was taken for the world, and this prayer is designed to help you remember that on a daily basis. So remember that. Remember that. Verse 13, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, so here's a verse that causes a lot of confusion. Everybody still with me? We're following the Lord's Prayer? Okay. Here's a verse that causes a little bit of confusion. Like, is it saying that, that God would actually lead us into temptation? Like, is it, it seems like it. Um, <laughs> like, he wants, he wants to lead us into temptation, and we need to petition, No, Lord, don't drag us into the temptation. Right? And, and I would allow you, I would, I, would, I would encourage you to, I would encourage you to allow Yeshua to, to set his own context for what he's saying here by looking at the next line. But deliver, but rescue us from evil. Rescue us from evil. And I would petition that the focus and the intent of verse 13 is not about God leading us into temptation at all. The weight the weight is on verse 14. For God cannot, look at this, here we go. James, James even, even, even confirms this. He says in James 1.13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So this, ver, this verse, this word temptation can also mean test or trial. Used many times throughout the gospel accounts. That clears that up, Test. And what I think Yeshua is trying to remind us of is that God is leading us in our lives. So where are we right now between Egypt and the promised land? We've been redeemed. We haven't seen the culmination of God's promises fully engulf the world, end of Revelation, end of Isaiah. So where are we? In the wilderness, we're wandering, right? We're wandering. This is the language Peter uses in 1 Peter. We're wandering. As if we're exiles wandering home, towards home. And so God is very much leading us. And that means we what? We follow. We are following God. And as we follow God, we will encounter tests and trials. And in those moments, we ask, we do petition God, lead us not into these areas. Like, if there's any way, lead us not in these areas. But, more importantly, rescue. Rescue me when I encounter them. Here, you sure never did that. You did. Yeshua went through two testings, if you remember. One at the beginning of his ministry, one at the end. The beginning was in the wilderness, where the voice of the serpent entered into his ear. I'd say, hey, you're hungry? Rocks. Hey, jump. Bow down. And he overcame. He overcame on behalf of Israel. These were the three tests that they failed in the wilderness in Exodus. At the end of his ministry, you find him in a garden knowing what's coming next. And, and he breaks down, and he's crying to his father, and he says, he says, God, I don't want to drink this cup. I don't want to drink it. I mean, if there's any way we're going through this, I know this is where you like, this is where we're going. If there's any way that we could just, like, move this cup out of my hand, Put it somewhere else. Can we just take this cup and drop it in the ocean? That'd be great. This is what he prayed in the garden. But nevertheless, your will be done. Nevertheless, I know that you're leading me, and despite the test and the trials, despite the tribulation, I know that you are God and you are leading me. I know that you are my rescuer. I know. That's powerful. That's powerful. As we wander through the wilderness, we know and we expect that there will be times through us following God that tests and trials, tribulations will occur, battles in our life, distractions. The emphasis on this verse is God is our rescuer. Prepare us. If we're going to go there, if we're going to go there, prepare us. Rescue us. Bring us through. Bring us through.
this is a prayer about preservation from sin and temptation. Um, Paul and Peter actually speak about this. They say, The Lord will rescue me from every attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Peter, same idea. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. In the wilderness, you're prone to attack. Yeshua is saying, just remember, God, God is your rescuer. And this is what you need to remember every single day. That this is not your kingdom. This is not your journey. This is, this is a wandering to something greater. This is a wandering to home. You will fight battles. You will go through tests and trials. Pray and remember that God is there and he is the rescuer. He's the rescuer. And this is the creed. This is the creed, uh, the prayer that fueled a revolution 2,000 years ago. And in Luke's account, um, like I said, it actually says like, like every time you pray, you recite this. As believers, as Christians, as followers of the king, uh, this is the kingdom creed. And so, and so I ask you, I, I petition you, I encourage you, every single day, do you pray this? And not in a way with a motive that it is a babbling or empty phrase or vain repetition, but in a way where, wow, this is the words of my master and I need to internalize them today. I, need to, I think Yeshua knew what he was doing when he asked us to pray it every day. Are we going to dare internalize this creed of this rabbi into our daily lives? And maybe for some of you, maybe it's not always this exact recitation of the prayer. Maybe it is something that is fluid. Maybe you are going through something in your life right now. And maybe you do, you do implement that in, in the focus of your life where you're struggling most. Maybe, maybe you do go, say, Father, I know I'm in a time of temptation right now and tribulation right now and I'm tripping and I'm falling and I'm getting hurt and Father, will you rescue me from the evil one? I pray that you rescue me from this conflict that I'm having in my life, from this offense that I'm having in my life, that you would help me forgive. Father, will you rescue me from this broken relationship I find myself? Will you give me your peace? Will you lead me out of this battle victoriously every day every day and worship team I guess you guys can, can come up I just, that's, it's a good time for you guys to get set up to, to conclude services but um, I want to take a moment to kind of have a, another Bible geek moment here so, so the doxology at the ending of Matthew do I have it here? I don't but that's okay so at the ending of Matthew um if you, uh, if you, if you remember, um, at the end of Matthew in your King James Version, it should say something like, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Anybody have that in their Bibles? So if you have an older translation of the Bible, not an NIV, ESV, not an ASV, um, you'll have that in there, and you also have a footnote that says the earliest manuscripts of this phrase are not found in this. In other words, when Matthew was originally written, this verse was not put in there. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. This is why a lot of newer translations omit it. It's not there, right? And a lot of people have a misunderstanding of why that was placed in. Why did early believers write that in and add that to the Lord's Prayer? And I'd like to share with you what I believe to be kind of a neat reason why it's placed in there. Do you know? A lot of people get upset because they're like, someone added to the Word of God here in the early church with pagans, and they added, and that's not necessarily the motivation. Um, this is actually kind of a summary of, of 1 Chronicles 29, of 1 Chronicles 29, in a prayer that David prayed. And I'd like to read that with you real quick. It's up on the screen. It's, 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 it's verse 10, starting in verse 10 of 1 Chronicles 29. But, there we go. Pra- praise be to you, Lord, the God of our Father Israel. From everlasting to everlasting, forever and ever, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are the strength and the power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. So it seems the earliest believers, when they recited the Lord's Prayer orally, because they didn't write everything down yet. That was a transition that was taking place. They decided that it would be a really neat idea 
to praise God after they said the prayer. And so they took a praise from King David and they attached it as a conclusion to the prayer of the son of David. And I just find that so cool. It's not part of the Lord's Prayer, which is why it's omitted in many of your Bibles and your other Bibles that do have it have a footnote. But it seems to be an early tradition of the early believers to end the prayer with a praise from King David. And that really means a lot to me. Um, I feel like that's just kind of neat. So that's your Bible trivia of the day. So please stand with me. And, and I'd, like to, I'd like to say uh, the Lord's Prayer alongside you as a people or as a kingdom. And guys, when we're finished with the Lord's Prayer, we're going to begin worship and conclude services just as we entered in. Um, and there's a prayer team that will be off to the sides. If I don't know what you're going through in your life this week. It could be something related to forgiveness or to, to not understanding and not showing gratitude and the understanding of God meeting your basic needs. It, it, could be, uh, it could be that maybe you're just lost in the wilderness and you're fighting a battle and you don't know for a fact if God is going to rescue you or not. Guys, we have a prayer team that's devoted to support you and pray with you in those areas. So I invite you to, to take part in that. Let's start as a community that is a follower and has pledged allegiance to Yeshua in this prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, yours is the kingdom. Amen. Shalom. I'm Matthew Vandrells, and I hope you enjoyed this message. Founded in Truth exists to cultivate a fellowship of image bearers that live the redeemed life only Yeshua can give. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, we would love to hear from you. Send us an email through the contact form on our website and tell us how God has used this ministry to edify your faith and relationship with Him. If you'd like to see more messages like this one, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here. If you'd like to donate to this ministry and be a part of what God is doing through it, you can donate through our online giving portal here. We thank you for your continued support, and we look forward to next time. Shalom.